Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. If you want to be sure you never miss an episode, subscribe to our podcast using your favorite podcast software, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, or Amazon Music at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. Also, I do encourage you, if you've not already, to pick up your Miss Investigator t-shirt over at famous.greatdetectives.net. We'll be closing orders for our first batch shortly. Although, you, if you're in the United States, you should still get your shirt by Christmas if you order by November 29th. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers, the original air date, January 13th, 1952, and the title is... Clip job. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Dates and places in the following story are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. You know, when Thursday rolls around, it'll bring more top radio entertainment to you over these NBC stations. Thursday starts right off in high gear with Robert Young starring as heroic and harassed Jim Anderson of Father Knows Best. The Andersons are just like your family, but funnier, for the head of the household can get himself involved in situations that take the concerted effort of wife and progeny to get unraveled. And usually Jim rises from the battle bloody but unbowed, and still firmly convinced that father knows best. For adventure fans, Thursday holds the promise of top mystery listening also, as NBC presents Mr. Keen, tracer of lost persons, who matches his deductive reasoning against the violence and murder of crime. Later, join Jack Webb as Sergeant Joe Friday of Dragnet, the true story of your police force in action. Father knows best, Mr. Keen, tracer of lost persons, and Dragnet. Hear all these and more Thursdays on NBC. Now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, from the files of the Texas Rangers, the case called Clip Job. It is 10 o'clock on the evening of January 24th, 1950. A bit of wind whips through the streets in the North Texas town of Bolton. As the clock in the town hall strikes the hour, an elderly woman makes her way toward a lighted drugstore. Oh, thank you, Mr. Garrow. Thank you. Uh, good night. Can I help you, ma'am? Are you Mr. Crando? Yes, ma'am. Some people have told me you know everybody here in town. Well, ma'am, I reckon I do. I've had this drugstore 23 years. Do you know a man named George Colley? Colley? Colley. No, ma'am, I, I don't believe I do. Um, uh, what's it look like? Well, he's a big man. Kind of stout, with gray hair. He's in the oil business. Well, ma'am, I might be wrong, but I don't recall anybody looks like that by the name of Collie. Of course, he could be new around town. Oh, no. He said he's lived here for years. Have you asked anybody else in town if they knew? Yes. I've asked all day. Hmm. And you're sure you got the right town? Mr. Collie said Bolton. He told me he lived on Corsi Street. That's right, ma'am. We got a Corsi Street here. I went to the address he gave me. People there never heard of Mr. Carley. I guess I've come a long way. From nothing. I'm sorry, ma'am. You've been very kind. Oh, not at all. Anything else I can help you with? I'll just look around a little, if you don't mind. Well, sure, sure. Just take your time. I'll go ahead wrapping up these orders. 
Mr. Crandall. Yes, ma'am? That bottle up there, how much does it cost? Uh, this one? The large one, just above it, with a red label. Oh, that bottle's not for sale, ma'am. We sell it by the ounce. How much is it an ounce? Dollar and a quarter. But it's poison, ma'am. You'll need a prescription to buy it. Prescription? Yes, ma'am, from your doctor. Oh. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> you feeling all right, ma'am? Yes, I'm all right. Well, you don't look so good to me, ma'am. You better come over here to the soda fountain and sit down. I'll, Please I'll, I'll leave get... me alone. Uh, uh... Ma'am! Ma'am! Operator! Operator! Uh, get me Doc Holmes and hurry! <laughs> The woman was taken to the county hospital where she was found to be in the first stage of starvation. Some letters in her handbag identified her as Mrs. Agnes Howell of Minden. Early the next morning, she regained consciousness and was able to talk. Upon hearing a story, Sheriff Ted Dreyer asked for assistance from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned and joined the sheriff at the hospital shortly after 8 o'clock. Sure glad you got here so quick, Jace. This one's a little too rough for me to handle. Want to give me a fill-in before we see Mrs. Howell? Well, Jace, I could, but I'd rather have you hear it direct from her. It, no, down this way. They had to put her in a charity ward. Didn't she have any relatives up in the town where she came from? Minden? Nope, I checked. Her husband died four months ago. She didn't have nobody else. You know, Jace, that poor old lady hadn't eaten in 48 hours? No money? When I went through her pocketbook for identification, I found 13 cents. Here we are. Ms. Howell's a third bed down. Mm. Morning, Ms. Howell. Uh, Ms. Howell, this is Ranger Pearson. I'd like you to tell him everything you told me. What's the use? He can't get my money back. Six thousand dollars. All I had in the world. Gone. Somebody stole your money, ma'am? I didn't know he was going to steal it. Mr. Colley, he seemed like such a fine man. Everything he said, I believed. Oh, I'm so ashamed. Oh, now, now, now Miss Howell. No, I'm sorry. I'm all right now. This Mr. Colley, do you know his first name? George. He seemed like the kind of man you could trust. Big and sort of stout with nice gray hair. When he come to the house, he said he'd been a friend of my husband's. How long ago was this, ma'am? Well, a month, I think. When I told him my husband was dead, he seemed so upset. He said he had a check for my husband. Five hundred dollars was the profit from one of Mr. Carly's oil wells. Had your husband ever said anything to you about investing in an oil well? No. But lots of people around men and have made money from oil. I didn't think there was anything wrong. Did Mr. Collie give you the check? Well, no. He said he wanted to do me a favor. Said he'd double my $500 in three days. When he came back, he told me he'd done even better. He had $1,200 for me. And then he said if you'd put the rest of your money to it, he'd make a lot more. Is that it? He told me I'd get at least $50,000. How did you know? I just had an idea. You gave him the money, didn't you, ma'am? Yes, I did. He promised me $50,000. Seemed like such a lot. It is, ma'am. And so's your 6000 When did you first get suspicious of Mr. Colley? About two weeks after he left. He said he'd be back in a week. When he didn't show up for a month, Miss Howell decided to come over here to Bolton and look for him. I had to. There wasn't any more food in the house. I was ashamed to go to the neighbors. Our life savings. I was such a fool. I'd like to get my hand on this collie fellow for just five minutes. I hope I can oblige you, Sheriff. Mrs. Howell, when Collie was in your town, did he stay at a hotel? Yes, he did. The Fuller Hotel. It's the only one in Minden. Mr. Collie seemed like such a nice man. And I 
still can't believe it. That's just what he counted on, ma'am. Come on, Sheriff. Let's take a ride over to Minden. Turn right at the next corner, Jace. Fuller Hotel's at the end of the block. Uh Uh-huh. You know, there's one thing I can't understand. How did this collie know to come right to Ms. Howell? It's an old racket, Sheriff. He's what we call a hearse chaser. Scouts around till he finds a widow with a little bit of money, and then he goes to work. But how did he happen to find Ms. Howell? He didn't just happen. Probably used the local newspaper. Checked the obituary columns for a few months back and picked out his victim very carefully. The rest was easy. Yeah, too easy. Sounds like he really knows his business. If he's the one I think he is, he's one of the smartest. We've been after him over a year. Haven't been able to get close to him, huh? Not yet. Most of the women he swindled don't come to us till months after it's happened. Mm, that makes it tough, all right. <laughs> Here's the hotel, James. Yeah. You sure were doing right coming over here to Minden? Seems like a mighty cold trail. No trail's ever cold, Sheriff. Not as long as it's a trail. And this is one I want to follow right to the end. Hmm. Clerk don't seem to be around. I reckon that'll bring somebody. Sorry, gents. I was just having a bite of lunch in the back. Oh, Sheriff, I didn't recognize you at first. Um, this is Ranger Pearson. Howdy, Ranger. Anything wrong? We'd like to get a little information from you. Well, now, I'd be right proud to answer anything you've got to ask. Always glad to help out a ranger. Do you remember a man named George Colley? Stayed here about a month ago. Well, that's real funny you asked about Mr. Colley. Oh? Kind of stout fella, gray hair, smokes big black cigars all the time. He the one you mean? You ain't seen him around here lately, have you? Nope. Uh, but me and my wife was talking about him just last night. Anything special made you remember him? Hmm. You bet there is. Ain't often a man keeps a big wad of cash in my safe like Mr. Colley did. Six thousand dollars it was. Brought it in the last day he was here. How'd you know it was six thousand? I made him count it before he put it in the envelope. All hundred dollar bills it was. I asked him why he didn't put that much money in the bank. Said he didn't trust banks. How long did Mr. Colley stay here? Two, uh, no, three days. Yeah, three days. Oh, I never forgot. There was something else he put in the safe. What was that? A gold ring with a diamond big as the end of your thumb. I said to him, sort of joking, now, Mr. Collie, you act like we got crooks here in Minden. And he answers real serious. You never know. Just like that. You never know. We have a look at his hotel bill. Uh, Mr. Collie done something wrong? Better just go ahead and get what the ranger asked. Hmm? Oh, sure. I didn't mean to get nosy. I'll have it for you in a minute. What do you want with Collie's hotel bill, Jace? Sometimes they're like diaries, Sheriff, and this one might give us the lead we're looking for. Here you are, Ranger. $21.50. Paid in full. Cash. It's mm, a pretty big bill for three days. Well, he had some cleaning and laundry done. Rush, so it was actually... You can see it right here. Mm-hmm. This item number four, 230 for telephone. Is that for local calls? No, we don't charge for local calls. I reckon Mr. Colley must have phoned out of town. Any idea who he phoned? Uh, that might be real hard to say, Ranger. We just get the charges and put them on the bill. Thanks. Come on, Sheriff. Where are we going, Jace? Down to the phone company. Think we might be on to something? I don't know, but it could be Mr. Colley left us a little message without knowing it. the phone company office, we learned that Collie had called a Miss Sally Ronson in Dallas. The number belonged to a fancy roadhouse near town. I left the sheriff in Bolton and headed for Dallas. On the way, I radioed Company B and asked them to have somebody locate Sally Ronson and keep her under surveillance till I arrived. When I pulled up in front of the roadhouse at 10 that night, Ranger Clay Morgan was waiting for me. Over here, Jase. Hello, Clay. I got your message, Jase. Cap wants me to work with you on the rest of the case. Good. Get a line on Sally Ronson? Uh Uh-huh. She tap dances in the floor show inside. Just watch the end of her act. She's got another show tonight. Let's go in. Sure. Jace, you think this girl is mixed up in the hearse chasing racket with Collie? Mm, It's hard to say. But he called her long distance. That's enough to start on. Mm -hmm. The manager said her dressing room was down at the end of the hall. How much did Collie get from the old lady in Minden, Jace? Six thousand. Everything her husband left her. Mm Mm-hmm. It must have been an awful easy mark. Maybe, but Collie's a pretty sharp article. Is this Sally Ronson's dressing room? Yeah. Just a minute. She sounds a little tired. Yeah, she's a little frayed at the edges. How much is... 
Oh, I thought you was the kid from the drugstore. I'm Ranger Pearson, ma'am. This is Ranger Morgan. All right, if we come in for a few minutes? Why not? Excuse me for not having shoes on. I'll go get my slippers. It's all right, ma'am. We just want to ask you a few questions. I'm getting so I never want to have shoes on when I'm not dancing. You know how bad it makes you feel when your feet get tired. Yes, ma'am. Sit down. No, thanks. Seems like I'm tired all the time now. <laughs> uh, seven years of dancing in places like this. What kind of questions do you want to ask? You know a man named George Colley? No, should I? He phoned you from a town called Minden about a month ago. <laughs> Lots of men phone me. They get the idea I'm glamorous because I'm a show gal. Oh, glamorous with swollen feet. You sure you don't remember hearing from George Colley? Ranger, look, I'd like to help you, but I don't even know him. Well, let's try again. He's a middle-aged man, stout, gray hair, smokes strong cigars. Oh, him. Well, why didn't you say so? The oil man. But his name's George Connor. Is that what he told you it was? Yeah, I guess he's got two names. Or 20. Why did he call you? To make a date. He always takes me out when he's near where I'm playing. Makes me tired with all his big talk, but he buys a good dinner. He in trouble? Yeah. You seen him recently? Uh, a week, maybe ten days ago. You expect to see him again soon, Miss Ronson? Look, Rangers, I can't afford to get mixed up in nothing. Bad publicity would ruin my booking. We'll see you don't get mixed up in it. When are you supposed to see him again? Tomorrow. Club's closed and I don't have to work. He's coming in town. Said he'd pick me up at my place at six. Want me to call you when he gets in? No, ma'am. If you don't mind, we'll wait there with you. This is one date we're all going to keep together. <laughs> In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Here's an important message about a serious problem. During the last four infantile paralysis epidemics, a total of $79 million was spent by the March of Dimes Fund in caring for those stricken with this dread disease. These were the four worst infantile paralysis epidemics in history. The funds are now gone. This is a crisis, and it can become a disaster. Unless you help more generously than ever before, thousands of crippled children might never walk again. Imagine the feelings of the young parents of a three-year-old when they hear the terrible diagnosis verdict, your child has infantile paralysis. Thousands of parents heard those words last year. By contributing to the March of Dimes, you can speed the day when those words need never be spoken again. You, by your contribution, can speed the research, research which is now pressing forward so hopefully toward an early solution to polio. Join the 1952 March of Dimes today. Send contributions to your local March of Dimes headquarters. Remember, this fight is yours. And now, back to the Texas Rangers. <laughs> We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and our authentic story, Clip Job. We put out a bulletin on George Colley with instructions to pay special attention to the area around Dallas. The next day we staked out in the lobby of Sally Ronson's hotel on the chance that Collie might show up early. A little after five, we joined her in her room and waited for Collie to keep his six o'clock date. At 6.30, he hadn't arrived. Sally made coffee for us on a hot plate she kept in her room. Can't understand why he don't show up. He's never missed a date with you before, has he, Miss Ronson? No. Here's your coffee, Ranger. It's not very strong, but it's hot. Thanks. Thanks, ma'am. I wish I'd never got mixed up with him. I didn't know he was a crook. Eh, it's not your fault. Suppose he puts up a fight when he sees you here. He might have a gun. Men like Collie don't often carry guns, ma'am. No need to get upset, Miss Ronson. You just relax and let us worry about Collie. Yeah. You got a coin for the radio, Ranger? Hmm? Oh, sure. Here. Thanks. You've never been this late before. Jace, you don't think he spotted us when we came up here, do you? I doubt it. He probably doesn't have any idea we're after him. Ranger, I can't help it. I'm getting scared. Couldn't I go somewhere and let you wait for him here? I'm afraid not, ma'am. Can't take the chance of him seeing you on the street. But if he comes... Answer it, ma'am. It might be him. What'll I say? Just what you would ordinarily. Or let him think there's anything wrong. I'll try. Hello? All right, operator. Hey, turn off the radio, will I'll you? I'll get the radio, Jess. Well, hello there. Oh? 
Well, if it can't be helped. Uh Uh-uh. No, it's all right. Yeah. And so long. It was him. Said he had some business and can't get to Dallas till day after tomorrow. Did he say where he was calling from? He didn't, but the operator said the call was from Wilford. Wilford? I see, that's about 150 miles from here. Uh-huh. Oil country. Chances are Collie's working another clip job. Chase, you figure we might be able to pick him up there? We'll give it a try. Call headquarters, Clay. Get them to cover this hotel. We're going to head for Wilford. <laughs> Arrived in Wilford late that night. A check of the hotels failed to locate Collie. Early the next morning, we went to the local newspaper office. We learned that a man answering Collie's description had been in a week before going over back issues. We checked the obituary columns of the same issues and got the names of four newly widowed women who might qualify as Collie's intended victim. We called at their houses and made inquiries. Just before noon, a Mrs. Helen Petrie gave us the break we were looking for. Why, yes, I know the man you're talking about, but his name's not Collie, it's Sanders. How long have you known this Mr. Sanders? Well, I've only known him a week, but he was a good friend of my husband's. Did he tell you that, ma'am? Yes, he did. And he's the most honorable man I ever met. He brought me $500, he said he owed my husband. From an oil investment? That's right. And he was so disturbed when he heard my husband had died. Said he just had to do something for me. He took the $500 away with him, didn't he, ma'am? Well, yes, but three days later he was back, and you know he had $900 with him, all for me. Did he say anything then about you investing more money so you could make an even bigger profit? Indeed he did. Matter of fact, I've got a check ready for him now, $5,200. Ranger, how do you know about all this? This may come as a shock to you, ma'am, but your Mr. Sanders is one of the slickest swindlers in Texas. Swindler? Why, that's downright ridiculous. Mr. Sanders is one of the finest men I ever met. I don't believe any of these things you're saying about him. I'm afraid what Ranger Pearson says is true, ma'am. We know of at least one woman who's already lost all her savings because she trusted him. Mr. Sanders wouldn't do a thing like that. You're sure you're not mistaken, Ranger? There's no mistake, ma'am. This man's a criminal. Well, I don't know what to say. Makes me feel weak all over. Mr. Sanders... He seemed so kind and and so honest. I know, ma'am. And we're sorry to have to tell you that he isn't. What can I do? He's coming to pick up the check. When? Two o'clock today. I I just don't know what I'm going to do. We'd like you to see him, ma'am, and we want you to give him your check. Just the way you planned to do. Well, I don't understand, Ranger. Would you give us permission to set up a hidden microphone in this room? Well, of course, but whatever for? We want to have a record of this man at work, just for our own use. You mean, you want me to talk to Mr. Sanders like like nothing's happened? That's right. And don't worry, ma'am. We'll be right in the next room. Oh, it's not that. It's... Well, I'm not sure if I can face him knowing what I do now. I never was much good at acting. Just do your best, ma'am. That's all we can ask. Clay? Yeah, Jason. How about pulling the car into a side street where it can't be seen and bring the tape recorder back with you? Sure. Better step on it. We've got a lot to do before 2 (laughs) o'clock. Sorry to be moving your furniture around, ma'am, but I have to get this microphone set. It's nearly two o'clock, Ranger. I'm just about finished. Uh Uh-huh. Now we'll try a test with Ranger Morgan in the next room. Testing, Clay. Rap on the wall if I'm coming through. All right, Mrs. Petrie. We're ready for your visitor. Oh, I've never been so nervous in all my life. You'll do all right. Just be as natural as you can. Ranger, you sure now you want me to give him the check? It's very important that you do. Oh, I wish I wasn't so nervous. I better get into the next room. Uh, Ranger, I think that... Good luck, ma'am. All set to record, Jase. Mrs. Petrie is scared as she sounds. Yeah, she's pretty nervous. You think she'll be able to carry it off? Yeah, it's a chance we have to take. Boy, you didn't get in here with any time to spare. Yeah. Give me that other set of earphones. Here you are. Thanks. Why, uh, hello, Mr. Sanders. Howdy, ma'am. Good to see you again. Uh, won't you come in? Well, thank you, ma'am. I've got the check all ready for you. Oh, there's no hurry on that, ma'am. Mostly I just stopped by to have a nice, friendly chat with you. Listen to that, oh. Jess. Yes. Well, uh, 
Won't you sit down? Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, sure is nice to sit a spell in a warm house on a cold day like today. Oh, brother. Yes, yes it is cold out. Ma'am, if you don't mind my saying so, you don't seem like yourself today. I don't. Uh... No, ma'am. Seems like you're upset about something. Oh, yeah. no, no, I'm, I'm perfectly all right. Now, ma'am, don't try to fool me. I might not be much of a hand with the ladies, but I do know when a friend's feeling upset, and I reckon I know just what's troubling you. You do? Yes, ma'am. It's that business deal we were talking over yesterday. Now you just put your mind at ease. If it's going to worry you, we'll forget the whole thing. Oh, no, no, no. I I want you to take the chance. Well, ma'am, you won't regret it for sure. Another month's time, you'll be a rich woman. But I understand how you feel. And you know your husband was such a fine fellow, I'd hate to think of his widow worrying over money. Oh, oh, it's all right, Mr. Sanders. I'm not a bit worried. Sure you are, and I don't blame you. Probably seems like a right lot of money to let go of, even if it is only for a short time. Well, I'll uh... tell you what. If, uh, well, if you feel like you can't afford it right now, you just tear up that check. Oh, he's playing it real no, smart. Well, mm. No, I thought it over and my mind's made up. I, I do want to go into your business. Well, all right, ma'am. But only if you're sure you want to. Well, the check's in my desk. I'll... I'll... Oh, what a shame, ma'am. Such a pretty face. Oh, I'm so clumsy. I better clean up the pieces before somebody gets oh, trouble. Oh, you, you just let me handle that, ma'am. I'll have it up right away. Thank you. I'll go get the check in the meantime. He's crazy if he hasn't noticed something wrong by now. Uh-huh. There we are, ma'am. And here's the check, Mr. Sanders. $5,200. Well, Mrs. Petrie, now that you have made up your mind, I can tell you you've made the what? Ma'am, your hand's shaking. It's nothing. I... You know, ma'am, I just got a hunch we shouldn't do business today. I'll be back to see you some other day. Mr. Sanders! Casey's taking off. Goodbye, ma'am. Come on. I'm sorry, Rangers. I just couldn't... That's all right, ma'am. Let's stop him, Clay. Right. Jace's in his car. Hold it, Carly! You got his tire, Jace? Yeah, let's go. Don't move, Carly. You're covered. All right. Get out of the car. What's this all about, Rangers? You might have killed me. It would have been too good for you, Carly. What are you calling me Carly for? My name's Sanders. You must have a tough time keeping track of all your names. Put out your hands, Carly. You're under arrest. Arrest? What for? Swindling. Me? You're making a mistake, Ranger. No, Carly. You made the mistake when you swindled Agnes Howell over in Minden. Agnes Howell? I don't know anybody by that name. I think she'll know you. Come on, Carly. She spent a long time looking for you. Let's not keep her waiting any longer. In just a moment, we will tell you the results of the case you have just heard. There's more good radio listening Wednesday night on NBC. Wednesday, come to Ivy College in the town of Ivy, USA. Yes, walk the pleasant campus of Ivy College with Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman as Dr. and Mrs. Hall of Ivy. There's adult comedy and heartwarming human philosophy in each sparkling broadcast of the halls of Ivy. Then, P.V., Gildy, Judge Hooker, Leroy, and all the gang bring you a half hour of mirth and music with the one, the only, the great Gildersleeve. Later, Groucho Marx is your genial paymaster of ceremonies on You Bet Your Life, radio's merriest quiz show. There's prize money for lucky contestants and fun for everyone as Groucho Marx asks the questions and provides the laughs. And for High Adventure on Wednesday, hear both Big Story and Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator. Yes, Wednesday means top entertainment on NBC. Stay tuned to the NBC radio network. Every day of the week, the finest entertainment is as close as this station. And now back to Tales of the Texas Rangers. And now, here are the results of the case you have just heard. George Colley was brought to trial on March 13, 1950. During the two months preceding his trial, Agnes Howell and three other women from various parts of the state filed charges against him for fraud. Of the $6,000 Mrs. Howell had lost, $3,800 was recovered and returned. On April 26, 1950, George Colley was sentenced to 
20 years in Huntsville Penitentiary. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. cast included Tony Barrett, Ken Christie, Virginia Gregg, Parley Bear, Ernie Newton, Herb Ellis, and Lillian Byam. Technical advisor was Captain M.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Charles E. Israel, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. Next, it's the big show. All this and Tallulah, too, on NBC. Welcome back. Well, this is definitely a bit of a change of pace for Tales of the Texas Rangers. Because generally, Jace is looking into violent crimes. However, I think that the mandate and jurisdiction of the Rangers is very broad. Even the modern day version of it. So I guess this is a plausible enough thing for them to look into. And certainly in terms of stories that were told in the media of the time, Dragnet uh, started doing these sort of bunko stories, and it got picked up by all sorts of other radio and television programs. The most notable and popular being Racket Squad, but we've heard episodes of The Silent Men and The Lineup focusing on frauds, along with uh, TV programs like Man Behind the Badge. I did appreciate that they made a point that a con man like this doesn't usually carry a gun, which does put it in contrast to some other radio programs, particularly New York-based programs that essentially assumes that all criminals act the same way. So some criminals carry guns, all of them will, you know, break out deadly weapons. And whether it's Superman or Boston Blackie or Philo Vance, there are plenty of episodes where I found myself saying, you know, those sort of criminals don't usually carry guns. It did seem that the sentence handed down was stricter than in many other programs as the perpetrator got 20 years. I'll listen to the end of the Dragnet episode, The Big Betty, and that did not specify sentences, so I watched the TV program. And it's and in The Big Betty, this woman leads a gang that commits a whole string of these sort of obituaries rackets. The TV version, it mentions that the penalty for grand theft is one to ten years, with the implication that that's what Betty got. Now, of course, there were 14 counts in her case, so, you know, depending on how the judge meted out the sentence, I doubt she got 140 years. He may have required some of these counts to be served consecutively and had some served concurrently, or could have just given her all of the accounts being served concurrently, in which case... For each of the 14 counts, you know, she would be serving all of the sentences at the same time. So she'd only be serving a total of 1 to 10 years. Those sort of fine details of sentencing don't work into a dragnet end scene. But Tales of the Texas Rangers just saying 20 years may be enough for some criminal to say, you know, if I'm going to do this obituary scheme, I don't think I'm going to do it in Texas. Well, now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Christine, Patreon supporter since December 2017, currently supporting us at the Master Detective level of $15 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Christine. And that will do it for today. A reminder, if you are enjoying this podcast, please subscribe using your favorite podcast software, whether that's Google Podcast or... Overcast, Good Pods, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives.
And if you are enjoying this podcast, please be sure to rate and review it wherever you download your podcast from. Well, we'll be back next Saturday with another episode of Tales of the Texas Rangers. And on Monday, we'll feature Sam Spade. Coming up tomorrow, Public Domain Video Theater, an episode of Dangerous Assignment. And on this podcast, listen in tomorrow for a special episode of Nightbeat, where... We'd walked a couple of blocks through the dark, empty streets when suddenly Bessie grabbed my arm. Mr. Stone, that man down the street, looking into that store window, Hmm? that's him. Oh, yes, same gray raincoat, same lad. And look, Mr. Stone, what's that in his hand? It's a piece of pipe or something. He's breaking that store window. Yes, you wait right here, honey. Oh, be careful, Mr. Stone, be careful. The fellow was reaching through the broken window glass for whatever it was that had struck his fancy. He heard me coming and he turned toward me. The wan streetlight did something to his face. It seemed twisted and torn. Blood was running down his hand where the glass had cut him. Then I saw what he'd taken from the window. A gun. What's the idea, Hal? He spun around and he started running for the elevated station down the block. And in the best tradition of the Rover boys, I stayed right on his tail. He turned back to see how I was doing and stumbled over a trash can near the curb. I up with an arm. Let go of me. Leave me alone. Uh, Let go of me. He slashed the gun across my face and began running again. I stopped long enough to take a quick inventory of my teeth. Up above, I heard the elevator train coming into the station. The young fellow had reached the station steps and was going up fast, trying to make that train. I reached for one of his legs. He turned and gave it to me right in the stomach. I folded up, and I just sat there, listening to the train pull away with a fellow on it, and remembering what Bessie had said about him being such a nice, polite... I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.